Tonight, our show is an enlightened evolutionary politics roundtable dedicated uh, to ideas about transforming the current political zeitgeist in the United States. And of course, if the United States changes, so too will everywhere else. Our we have a distinguished group of people from Representative Dennis Kucinich, Ralph Nader, Rocky Anderson, presidential candidate, and social philosopher Barbara Marks Hubbard. Our United States political system and government, based on a unique constitution and bill of rights, centered around not a patriarch or a monarch or a head of state, but around the people, Enjoy the respect and admiration of people and nations around the world. Even though the founding of this country began with a vision, a set of values, and an idealism which supported the inalienable rights of the people, it, like any bold idea, was always fraught with internal differences and conflict. With some level of reason and consideration, it worked through the differences and managed to find at least some viable balance between the forces that sought to control it and dictate its direction. Historically, many of the choices upheld justice, and many were, unfortunately, I think it is fair to say, reprehensible, but always justified by those who perpetrated them. But at this point, it appears that we have reached not just a crossroads, but perhaps a boiling point. Climate change, economies flapping in the wind, the absence of integrity in the very structure of our government, including the Supreme Court, think Citizens United and others, executive orders which in effect support the disintegration of our Constitution, and nearly endless litany of abuses of others and its own people, we are now in dire need of conscious intervention. We have a mainstream media that controls the conversation, and we have an alternative media which continually seeks to bring greater truth toward and forward to the people. At this crossroads, I've convened this roundtable of dedicated, innovative thinkers who have been in and around politics for much of their professional careers. A quick word of introduction about our participants in the roundtable, as a few of them were kind enough to come on, if briefly, as time permits. First, Representative Kucinich, Dennis Kucinich of Ohio, who we have had on the show a few times, has an outstanding record of being an advocate for the people and not being swayed by money or or public opinion. Dennis has run for the Democratic nomination for president a few times and was considered by many of us to have been the strongest candidate as his opinions and platforms are truly progressive and always for the people. He called for the impeachment of G.W. Bush and stood up against public opinion for truly most of his career. Ralph Nader is another one of our participants, uh, if briefly today. He, Ralph is perhaps America's most renowned and effective crusader for the rights of consumers and the general public, a role that he has uh, been uh, engaged in for decades. He has also been brought into regular conflict with both business and government as a result. He began Nader's Raiders many years ago, which was a group of committed people who conducted massive research into government's practices, blew the whistle on them, and proceeded to offer common-sense solutions. Public Citizen and Center for the Study of Responsive Law are but two of over a dozen nonprofit organizations Ralph Nader has helped to found or co-found. He is the author of many books and has run for the presidency six times. Ralph's latest book is called Getting Steamed Over Corporatism, and we hope to have Ralph on to discuss that book in depth. Rocky Anderson, another one of our participants, has been on the airwaves here at PRN and A Better World Radio a number of times. Rocky served as a two-term mayor of Salt Lake City. He is the executive director of High Road for Human Rights. Prior to serving as mayor, he practiced law for 21 years in Salt Lake City, during which time he was listed as in Best Lawyers in America and many other organizational, uh, professional organizations. Rocky reduced the carbon footprint of the city of Salt Lake in three years during his being mayor. He is a humanitarian through and through and now is running for president of the United States in the Justice Party.
Our last participant is Barbara Marks Hubbard, who... <laughs> In 1984, to name her involvement in politics, was named, uh, and her name was placed in nomination for the vice presidency of the United States on the Democratic ticket, calling for a peace room, sounds familiar, to scan for, map, and connect, communicate what is working in America and the world. Emphasis on the affirmative. That's the way Barbara is. Barbara's been a guest on A Better World a number of times. She is also in her own right a prolific author, visionary, social innovator, evolutionary thinker, and educator. Barbara co-founded and is chairperson of the Foundation for Conscious Evolution and author of numerous books, the last most recently being Birth 2012. So with that introduction, I would like to, in respect to time of Representative Kucinich, uh, dive right in. Dennis, are you on the line? Yes. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be on your show and with uh, so many distinguished Americans. Thank you. Wonderful. Absolutely. I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to make it. Um, Congressman, you are an interesting man in many ways. Uh, you occupy a role in Congress that very few people do. You are outspoken, you do not take no for an answer, you are persistent, and you speak truth to power. That is a very unusual role. What I would like to know, and I would like our audience to know from you, is since you're living the life of a congressman, what is it actually like, before we get to the more enlightened part, to be there day by day living the life of a congressman? Uh, each day I focus on matters at hand that relate to my constituents uh, and the greater Cleveland area uh, to America and the world. And there's work to be done at every level. Uh, I have found that since the time I've been in Congress, the most uh, strenuous efforts are put into trying to uh, avert war, get us out of war, uh, create structures for peace. The, uh, but the life that I have is, uh, has been uh, productive, uh, exciting, uh, challenging, uh, pretty much 18 hours a day where you don't even notice time passing. Mm, amazing. Time becomes an illusion. It's almost... Uh, it, 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 if you're familiar with the Salvador Dali painting of yes. clocks melting, it's really <laughs> it's an experience of time in an altered form. Interesting, an altered state of consciousness, if you will. <laughs> That's very good. Now, you bump into many difficulties, challenges on the daily basis as well. Pressures, you could say, to conform to certain ways of thinking. Let's say to performing in certain ways for purposes of fundraising. Tell us a little bit about that when you see government well, you know, going wrong. Let, well, let me offer this perspective. I, I can tell you that when, you, when you're sure what you stand for, there's no pressure. There's no pressures to conform because you just have to be who you are, and how hard is that? Mm -hmm. So the, so I, don't, I, I am perhaps the wrong person to talk to about pressures on the job because... Uh, I've never looked at it that way. I'm, I, I, I stay in the flow. I know what my commitments are. I uh, pour myself into those commitments for uh, social and economic justice, for, for peace, for a cleaner environment, for a, a world that will not disintegrate, and for the interest of my constituents. And I don't get distracted. And the pressures that come up, uh, yes, there, you have to raise money to run campaigns. That's true. Uh, yes, you have to uh, make certain appearances in certain places so people know that you love them. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, okay. But if you proceed every day with a sense of joy, I can tell you there's no pressure. It's just, uh, it's just uh, a chance to serve it's a, and, a, and, a, and actually a privilege to serve. Yes, indeed. I understand, and I very much appreciate that. And your answer actually just further reflects the notion of bringing an enlightened... Um, leadership into the body politic, because that's just what you expressed, and uh, as I would expect, by the way. So if you could wave, let's say, a magic wand, Dennis, over the body politic of the United States to implement changes that you feel would make it more productive so that we could reduce 
or eliminate even really war, change the military budget, begin to pe- put people back in houses, correct the ailing economic system, get people back into jobs and schools, what would you do? Public funding of campaigns. Uh, that's the first thing. Changing the monetary system so that we, um, uh, we take back from the Federal Reserve that which was given away by the government 100 years ago, and that is the right to coin or create money. There, therefore, the government would have the ability to be able to um, create millions of jobs rebuilding America and meet the needs of our country debt-free. Mm-hmm. Um, change, change the role of the military from one of, which is offensive to, to defensive. Uh, looking at the, uh, you know, really work upon a vision of a world as one instead of America above all the other countries of the world. America is a part of the countries of the world looking to cement international agreements on, on getting rid of nuclear weapons and, um, and on getting rid of biological and chemical weapons and having a small arms treaty, a landmine treaty, joining the International Criminal Court. I mean, we really need to join the world community and not be separate. We need, we need to unite global citizens. In a way, we are at the threshold of an era where, um, where even the nation state itself uh, begins to, to lose its, uh, its cohesive power. And that uh, far and away uh, from the nation state, is the uh, is the principle of human unity, mm-hmm. which surrounds it all. Uh, nation states are contained within that, but they don't and should not usurp it, or should not um, uh, limit it, or forbid it. Mm-hmm. And so we're at it. We're really at the threshold of new possibilities for uh, uniting people the world over, and that's where I've kept my. Uh, vision, and that's where I shall continue to keep it. Indeed, I hear you. I so wish many of your colleagues, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I wish that many of your colleagues shared that same global and unified point of view, a higher point of view. Do some of your colleagues actually share that? Can you have these kinds of conversations with them? Well, I, I think that everyone understands the insufficiency of our present system. And uh, the uh, pressures for election are are challenging for many members who they have to um, win at a district level. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you have a, a, a and what's called for is a, di- a district, a national, and international uh, view, which is which is integrated. Yes, and indeed. not compartmentalized because the compartmentalization produces compartmentalized thinking, which produces policies that are incoherent. <laughs> yes. Now, now uh, the people I serve with are good people. The system is rotten. The system, which is a public auction, pay-to-play, which uh, policy goes to the highest bidder, is is a doomed system. You can't really achieve anything that's a public good when special interest groups are always going to be intervening between uh, the elected and those uh, who are who elect them. And so we, that's why public, uh, that's why we have to not just reverse Citizen United. We have to say that there cannot be any private money in elections. It can be only elections at a federal level should only be publicly funded. And one way of addressing that is build grassroots support to have that kind of a system at every level of government. Would but that's, say- a, that's a real significant problem now because we can't, yes. you, know, one of the, you know, arms manufacturers will continue to work for greater spending for, uh, for the military and for capital expenditures for arms. Um, you know, what, these wars that we've been in since 9-11 mm-hmm. have been a bonanza for uh, uh, military contractors for war profiteers, and you know our energy pol- policies, uh, which feed directly into our military policies, or military policies feeding into energy policies. You know they're they're all a reflection of a misplaced priorities of attempts to attempt to dominate other people to take their assets or resources uh, because we're more powerful. We have to stop this. We have to stop the uh, empire building. It's over. We can't. The, the, there's the world is interconnected and interdependent and there is no point whatsoever in trying to be the policeman of the world and trying to be the king of the world that's all silly yes uh, we, we need to act upon the essential interconnectedness of all people and from that enforce every place where we can the fact that human unity is the is the underlying reality of our 
of our of, of our uh, existence. Planet, yep, and that's where I come from. I so appreciate that. Now, my question to you, my last question for the moment is. What is the biggest obstacle from that being manifest in the body politic that you see? Um, lack of imagination, lack of courage. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, people, people sell themselves short. They believe that they can't make a difference. And um, you can always make a difference. And, mm-hmm. you know, whether you're in an office or not, whether you, you know, I, I'm going to be out of office and... Uh, in seven months, but I can tell you that I plan on on a, on a stepped up activity because there's some ways in which being in Congress, you know, requires a commitment of time that you don't have the chance to do some other things in terms mm-hmm. of helping to organize nationally and internationally. Well, you know, mm-hmm. I'm going to have uh, uh, be looking at a new direction. But for those who say, well, you know, the system is all screwed up and you can't do anything about it, uh, you know, it's time for us to do a reality check on ourselves. Mm-hmm. and what our commitments are, mm-hmm. and notwithstanding the experience we have, not to be uh, lulled by uh, temporary setbacks or defeats, but to look to the bigger picture of what it is we hope to achieve. And what I hope to help become an, uh, a continuing agent for is uh, for people being able to unite worldwide uh, and for the uh, nation states to either be consistent with the practical aspirations of people for peace and for 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 social and economic progress or uh they become irrelevant right so this is you know and for people who want more information keep in touch with kucinich.us kucinich.us and we'll keep you posted on our uh, on our work do you have uh ready plans at hand for oh what? yeah you you Stay tuned. That's what I'll say. Okay. I was wondering if you'd give us a little prelude. I just did. <laughs> okay, fine. I like it. Then it's got U.S. Yes. And I, I appreciate it. Thank you for doing this show, and thanks for including absolutely. me. Absolutely. You know, along with uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard, uh, Rocky Anderson, and Ralph Nader, who are all good friends. Thank Indeed. So Wonderful. Dennis, thank you so much for being on the okay. show today, and we'll speak thank to you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so it's very interesting. Talk about enlightening. We got a true take on someone who is in the thick of it and uh, can still and does very much maintain his own clarity of vision and his own commitment to what's right. And as he said, the hours pass like nothing, like a melting clock in a Salvador Dali painting. And there's really no fluff. When he's committed, he can go on his track, and that's that. How I would love to hear that from the other members of Congress. Now we have uh, Ralph Nader on with us. I am so glad to have Ralph on. Welcome to the show, Ralph. Nice to be on. Good. I'm so glad. I did an introduction of you earlier in the show, and I also want to say that uh, we hope to have you on again to discuss your latest book um, so we can go into some depth. I know you don't have a whole lot of time today. Uh, What I'd like to do, since you've been involved in politics for so long, decades, uh, in one way or another, having run for president half a dozen times, when you take a look at the body politic in the United States, about which you're working around in one way or another every single day, what do you see as the central problems and what do you see as the primary solutions that you would like to see if you were able to, let's say, wave a wand and implement the changes you would like to see? Well, the central problem is that uh, most people in this country don't believe in themselves to the uh, point where they can uh, be self-governing and where they can put uh, uh, muscle behind we the people, which is the way our Constitution starts in its preamble. So you can uh, criticize the Congress. I'm sure your other guests are going to do quite forcefully. Mm-hmm. And the runaway presidency and the criminal wars of aggression and the increasing poverty in our country and the abandonment of our corporations with jobs and industries to fascist and communist regimes overseas who know how to keep their workers in their place. And yes. you can add things like, well, the the whole progress in 70 years is now 
vulnerable to being rolled back by the craven worst Republican Party in its history that dominates Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. Or you can talk about Wall Street collapsing the economy with greed and then going to the taxpayer for a bailout. But what it really comes down to is how many people are going to organize first to take over their Congress in every congressional district. And if we had 100 people in every congressional district to get the ball rolling, where they really take it serious, reflecting the long overdue changes in this country, like living wage, the minimum wage now is way below what it was in 1968, adjusted for inflation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be $10 now instead of $7.25 federal. Yes. Uh, so and uh, effectively full gone down. All, yeah. And uh, get the wars over with, bring the soldiers back home, change the tax system, uh, have real law enforcement on corporate crime and fraud, and shift power from the few to the many in a lot of good ways like clean campaigns, public financing of campaigns, mm-hmm. and letting workers form u- unions more easily, and, and letting consumers and others uh, band together through inserts and uh, banking and insurance company billing envelopes. All these things, you know, we've studied these, they've been documented, They're, they have been working in a few areas here and there, but they haven't spread around the country. So what's the main pivot to turn the country around? Yes. It's Congress. You turn Congress around, you turn the executive branch around, because Congress has the most power under the Constitution, even though, as Dennis Kucinich has pointed out, it doesn't use it and abandons it. Uh, to the uh, presidency. So my focus is really trying to get people to start these Congress watchdog groups uh, on changes and redirections that are pretty much supported by a majority of the folks back in their district, like living wage, uh, like cracking down on corporate crime, uh, like full Medicare for all, and so forth. Even getting out of Afghanistan is now about 70% of the people. Uh, support that in the polls. But it's amazing how much time on good radio and good TV, um, those are rare descriptions, by the way, Yes, uh, is spent on diagnosis and on recounting all the injustices. And almost no time is spent on how do you get a 100, then a 1,000, then maybe a couple thousand in each congressional district to band together in Congress watchdog groups. Every congressional district has colleges, community colleges, other institutions like that, and they have 650,000 people, uh, average, in every congressional district. Mm -hmm. So it's not out of range for people to get together the way they do for bowling leagues and the way they do for sports uh, and, and get together and... Pony up a hundred bucks a year, raise or contribute. Open up two offices every congressional district, and back them up with thousands of volunteer hours by the one thousand or two thousand people in every congressional district. And I'll guarantee you, you can propose this from coast to coast on talk radio. You'll never get a follow-up question because we don't focus on mobilizing people. And that's the start of justice, freedom, liberty, and a government of buying for the people. But you will not get follow-up questions. People are bored by proposals on how they can get organized themselves and stop either withdrawing into apathy or spending their days carping and whining. And blaming others. Yeah. So at the end of the day, in a sense, you could almost say, Ralph, it's a psychological issue of people not believing in that themselves. they have the power. That Yes, indeed. They don't in believe themselves. that they have the power. They, they don't even ask themselves the question. The, the people are sovereign under our Constitution. As I said, we the people. It's not we the corporations that starts the yes. Constitution. Yes. But they never ask themselves the question, why are we giving up our power to 535 men and women in Congress, the majority of whom have sold out to big business and have abdicated their constitutional responsibilities for peace and for justice uh, to an executive branch that also is run by former corporate executives Indeed. or by politicians who are dialing for corporate dollars. Yes. See that? Why are you giving up so much of your power? And I think that grabs people. That yeah. question is a real starter. 
Now, in your various organizations that you work within the Center for the Study of Responsive Law and others, are you involved in and what are you seeing about people's response on a grassroots level to this kind of district uh, awareness and action? To get underway in one of two ways. It takes a lot of time in every congressional uh, uh, district by a very few people, because only a very few people start anything. Mm-hmm. Or it takes a billionaire or a multi-billionaire who's in his 70s or 80s and 90s and is enlightened mm-hmm. and it, it has a different perspective on life for his grandchildren or her grandchildren yes. to put about $80 million dollars and that will organize what I just said in each congressional district for a year to, to kickstart it, you see? Yes, that's and, what you and, wrote and a book what, about that. Right, and yeah. I wrote a book about that. It was a book of fiction, but it could happen. It's called, uh, in quotes, Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. Yes. And I've written uh, the most recent book that you alluded to. Yes. It's called Getting Steamed uh, Over and corporatism. Overcoming corporatism and it's got that plan that i mentioned in mm-hmm. the afterward about mm-hmm. organizing in every congressional district you got to start yes. with a place where you have a fulcrum where you have a real lever and congress for all people say about it is the most vulnerable or susceptible uh, to change faster than the executive and judiciary branches to, uh, which uh, operate on congressional appropriations so congress- in other words local pressure exerted from all of the different districts across the United States yeah. would begin to shift the attention of the Congress from corporate focus to people focus. Exactly. Or, or you know, they either will shape up or they'll be shipped out. Yes, and, and And actually, I saw this happening in the mid-60s with people who were considered in the pockets of big business, like Senator Warren Magnuson from Washington State. He was mm-hmm. the powerful chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee. And because the rumble from the people started coming in the 60s mm. against the war in Vietnam, on civil rights, on women's rights, on consumer and environmental activity, he became, Warren Magnuson became, the greatest champion of consumer legislation in the Congress in American history. One bill after another, Mm. you see? Yes. Because he heard the rumble from the people. When Nixon heard the rumble from the people emanating out of the 60s, he signed into law bills he never believed in. The Environmental Protection Act, the Occupation Safety and Health Act, the Product Safety Commission Act, uh, on and on. Yes. Why? Because he heard, he, he heard the rumble from the people. There hasn't been much of a rumble from the people. And if someone says, well, what about the Tea Party? Well, where did the Tea Party get its attention other than having their own TV network, Fox? A billionaire. It, yeah, all, it, yeah, they were. But it all started with showing up in August of 2009 at these con- congressional uh, meetings back home. You know, when in August, when the members of Congress went back home, yes. the Tea Parties roared into this auditorium in one district after another and began making their demands known. And just that kind of awakening, whatever you say about the Tea Party, it, that kind of awakening reverberated all the way to Capitol Hill. Indeed. Indeed. And, and they had a resounding effect. can't even get the Democrats other than Dennis Kucinich and about 18 of them, yes, to push, as they did last uh, week, for a $10 minimum wage, which would increase consumer demand in a recessionary economy, which has 70% support in the polls. I mean, Canada is $10 and a quarter, and the Canadian dollar is now even with the U.S. dollar, $10 yes. and a quarter minimum wage. It's seven and a quarter in this country, the lowest in the Western world. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Mm. And if the Democrats can't take that as a winning issue politically, uh, if they don't care about the moral and humanitarian issue, then they're really gone. They're dead in the water. Indeed. Well, what if you take the the statistic that some 70% of Americans are all for pulling out of Afghanistan, enough of the war finished, and yet Congress or the executive branch does not do anything substantive about it except for rhetoric? Well, because first of all, Congress has, uh, has lost its will to hold the presidency accountable. There mm-hmm. should be no wars without declaration of war. Congress yes. hasn't declared war since since uh, December 1941. 
Uh, so against uh, Japan and Germany. Uh, so they're not upholding their constitutional responsibilities. This is something Rocky Anderson, the Justice Party, uh, has been pointing out uh, all over the country. Indeed. That Congress has abdicated its responsibility, and that leaves a runaway presidency. Exactly. And President Obama has now extended George W. Bush's empire range around the world in ways no one ever dreamed of True. Uh, when he was running in 2008. He has stated that he is willing, he is ready to go into any country, violate any sovereignty, kill anybody that is under suspicion of aiding and abetting or whatever uh, uh, terrorism, uh, using terrorism to attack terrorism, uh, blowing up uh, by mistake uh, civilians, uh, even though they they knew that there were civilians in the area. Yes. Uh, and on and on. I mean, you see this in the papers constantly, and Congress doesn't even start impeachment proceedings. But they don't even start congressional investigation. Never mm-hmm. mind impeachment disease. Yes. Why don't you be as good as Senator Fulbright, who started fundamental uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee investigations on the Vietnam War? and put the facts before the American people. Yes. Our, our democracy is in serious decay, and it's very important for people to support uh, politicians or would-be uh, politicians. And I'm glad you're, you're giving some voice to uh, Rocky Anderson, who's running for president of on the Justice Party, former mayor for two terms of Salt Lake, Salt Lake. City. And the great Dennis Kucinich. Yes. And let me just tell you one thing. Please. To show you the decay... You remember Tom Snyder of NBC? Mm -hmm. Okay, he had a major program uh, for years, a talk program on NBC Network, Coast to Coast. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1976, Tom Snyder had every third-party candidate on for an hour. And it was a civil discussion, just him and the candidate. For example, uh, Peter Kameho, running on the Socialist Worker Party. Mm Mm-hmm. And now you would never see that. You would never see a national TV network give one hour or more uh, to a third-party candidate. We're operating under a two-party dictatorship, and until that dictatorship is broken, what I call the two-party duopoly uh, in my moments of understatement, (laughs) it's a two-party tyranny. You bet. Until that's broken, you will never break the grip of corporatism, which now owns both parties. Listen, I quote you all the time, Ralph, when you talk about twiddly dumb and twiddly d. I've been quoting you for years, so I completely appreciate your point. We have had Rocky Anderson on this show a couple of times for the full hour, and so has Gary Null, as well as Jill Stein and Gary after this show. We'll yeah, have good. another group of third-party candidates here at PRN. We are very committed to giving voice to the other candidates that you will not hear, as you're saying, on mainstream media. And I suggest that when you do give them voice, you challenge the larger media, what is euphemistically called the mainstream media, yes. to do likewise. Yes, indeed. For heaven's sake, can't they afford once in a year to give an hour to a third-party candidate whose agenda often, by the way, is supported by majority of the American people? Not all yes. the agenda, but, but, but a lot of the issues, for example, Rocky Anderson's running on, would pass a, would pass a majority support test, Absolutely. whether it's uh, ending the wars or living wage or full Medicare for all. Exactly, and rule so of I law. Think you need to, I think the, the good little media has is, is got to challenge the larger commercial corporate media. That's right. Well, we do everything we can to do that, Ralph. I very much appreciate your input and all you have to share with us, because uh, the words are wise, you have uh, decades of experience, and uh, I just really am grateful for your sharing that with our audience here at A Better World Radio. Well, we're very happy, Mitchell, that you're doing this. Well, thank you. Thank you. We will have you back on, and you're welcome to stay on. I'm going to bring Rocky Anderson on right this moment. And <laughs> well, then... let Rocky have the time. Okay. He, he's got a lot to say. He sure does. And uh, I appreciate your invitation for an encore. Absolutely. I will be following up with you. Thank you very much, Mitchell. Thank you, Ralph. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye. That's Ralph Nader, who is, as I said, uh, a star among all those who have been fighting for justice and on behalf of the people. 
Now we are going to just say that uh, you are listening to Mitchell J. Rabin here at A Better World Radio on Progressive Radio Network. Please join us every Monday night at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We're on and we talk about the sung and the sung on unsung heroes. We talk about the ideas of transformation, of evolution, of creating a better world, of a shift in consciousness that will allow us to step up to a new operating system. So as Dennis Kucinich and Ralph Nader were just saying so beautifully, we can see the world as a unified whole and within that context, take us the next step together instead of being divisive be unified. It's an old story. It's not new, but it's time for implementation. So on that note, I it's very much my joy to, uh, we have two other guests on. We have Rocky Anderson first, and then we'll bring in Barbara Marks Hubbard, who's been thinking about these matters since she first met uh, President Dwight Eisenhower um, back when she was a teenager. So uh, please stay tuned and much more to come until the end of our show. Rocky Anderson, are you there? I am, Mitchell. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and what an amazing group of people uh, to have on during one hour, and uh, I, I really so appreciate you helping get out the word that the corporate media has simply refused to do, and uh, I think it's for one clear reason only, and people in this country are becoming more and more aware of it, and it's because the corporate media is promoting the corporate interests, and they don't want the people to hear the truth in this country. Well put. Well put, Rocky. Well, welcome to the show, and thank you for your good words, and I just want to say how much I appreciate your throwing your hat into the uh, the circle for running for president. This is an incredibly difficult challenge. I've been watching you over the past few months, and uh, in some ways working with you, and very much looking to bring out your message because mainstream media, euphemistically put, uh, <clears throat> is not interested. I know you've been on MSNBC. I know you've been on CNN, but these are essentially sound bites. But here at PRN, you know that uh, Gary Knoll, myself, and other hosts are interested in your full tilt perspective on how to change our government and bring it to a more enlightened state and more evolved condition. Because as we all know, that is what we need. So thanks well, you know, again. I, I think I think it's so great that, that uh, Barbara's on your program today because this, the whole notion of us consciously evolving. Yes. And then what Ralph said and, and what Dennis Kucinich said, the common thread is people need to believe in themselves. Yes. Just as, as, as Ralph just stated. And, and Dennis, uh, of course, saying that, that we have all got to push together if we're going to achieve the kinds of changes that will promote the public interest, finally, rather than simply the corporate interest, the interest Absolutely. of those who have bought and paid for our Congress and for our White House. And I think the, 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 the most powerful thing that, that people can understand, that can, that can empower themselves, that can inspire them, is to understand that not only in this country but around the world, when people have cared enough and they've been willing to stand up and fight, they have been able to overcome, and it's no different this time. This is where we are now in terms of having the greatest disparity in wealth and income at any time in this nation since the 1920s with a two-tiered system of justice where criminal laws are only applied against those of us among the masses and not against this elite powerful class that seems to have no accountability under the law, whether it's those who committed massive fraud on Wall Street or those who engaged in federal felonies when they subjected American citizens' communications to illegal surveillance or those who engaged in torture contrary to the War Crimes Act, our own domestic laws as well as treaties like the Geneva Convention, the Convention Against Torture. We are at a state now, Mitchell, 
where we can either choose to sit back and see this continuation of a real trend toward fascism. And I I never use that term lightly. Mm -hmm. But we can't also ignore what is happening in this country with this this totalitarian uh, presidency, uh, a real trend uh, toward an imperial presidency where the executive branch has claimed the power to do things that I never thought we would see in this country. The kinds of things, the, the, the totalitarian tyrannies in other nations used to do, and we were so proud to distinguish ourselves from those governments. Exactly, exactly. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. Who ever would have thought, Mitchell, no one. <laughs> that the Congress and our president <clears throat> would pass and sign into law legislation that would allow our government to point the finger at anybody, that's anywhere, right. and right. say, according to their judgment, that person can be rounded up, basically kidnapped, put away, perhaps without any notice to their families at all as to what happened to yes. them, no legal representation, no right of habeas corpus, no charges, and no trial. Of that, course, you're referring to the National Defense Authorization Act and an executive order that followed that. I, I totally appreciate what you're saying. It, but it was I, President Obama who requested yeah, those powers. Yeah, I'm aware. I'm aware so of this. It, the assassination of U.S. citizens with no semblance of due process. And now a kill and, list that's been revealed. I want to remind us, Rocky, of a very important point that, interestingly, both Dennis Kucinich and Ralph Nader made, which is that while I feel very much exactly as you do about the heartbreak. In fact, the question I asked uh, originally that I had written down for you was knowing that we both feel the heartache and the heartbreak of what has happened to this country. They both pointed a finger to a very interesting place, and that was back to us, we the people, for taking action on a grassroots district level to make the changes we want to see. Now, I'd like to bring in Barbara for a moment because I want to move us around to the visionary component of what you embody as a presidential candidate, for which I have such admiration for. And Barbara, who has been a social philosopher, a futurist, an evolutionary thinker for so long, what you would have to say now that you have come Barbara, into alignment with the listening of Dennis, who I know is a dear friend of yours, Ralph Nader, and Rocky Anderson. Barbara, are you there? Oh, okay. We're having a momentary technical glitch, and then we will circle back to Rocky uh, after we get Barbara's input if she is in fact there. Okay. So, okay, fine. In the meantime, I want to use this precious several last minutes, Rocky, to ask you, upon your, let's say, in the best of all possible worlds, due to the greatness of social media and viral thinking and viral marketing and the like, if you were, in fact, to become president or highly influential into the body politic, what is it that you would like to see? And then we'll come back to Barbara in a moment. I want to see justice in this country. I want to see that everybody is held accountable under the law, that no one is above the law, and that we return to those over three decades in in this country's history where we had a strong middle class. Where, where the wealthy were paying their fair share of taxes, where people were being paid fairly, where there wasn't this massive disparity in terms of the ratio of what CEOs were making and what regular working people Indeed. Uh, were making. So, and where there is control of financial institutions, so we never see the kind of meltdown we did 
uh, and, and from which people are still reeling, not only in this country, oh, but around yes. the world. Indeed. So Indeed. I understand Barbara's back. Maybe you want to go to sure, her. Sure, I, I but, will. And then we'll come back around to you, Rocky. Barbara, hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Have you been listening? Have you been on? Or was that just a last moment uh, telephone no, I've glitch? Been li- I've been listening to everything. Excellent. Excellent. I'm so glad. You you know, your dear friend Dennis Kucinich opened it up and uh, Ralph know. Nader and everybody's been continuing. Rocky Anderson has just been asking about what your input is would be here and i i welcome the same we're we've been both diagnosing many of the issues but we're also focusing primarily on solutions from an evolutionary and conscious point of view what we as individuals populating this beautiful country can do to make a difference i'd love to hear what you have to say about that yes first of all i'm honored to be on this call with such a wonderful pioneering evolutionary oh thank uh, you Thank you so much for what you're doing, Rocky. Uh, I have had the idea, when I ran for vice president, over 200 delegates placed my name in nomination to create a new social function in president, which, as you said, is mapping, tracking, and connecting what's working and communicating it to the people for greater participation. Now, that's not the solution to everything, but it's an, it is actually necessary to get the the power and motivation to shift the system. So what we're doing right now is convening a planetary celebration of what's working. And we're doing it on December 22nd, 2012, inaugurating what we're calling day one of what is being born that's good. Now, this is not the solution to every problem, but it activates the impulse of creativity in everybody. And it is our hope to contribute to these political pioneers by the social evolutionary potential of people wanting to create together. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to say I expand Thomas Jefferson to say, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Everybody is born creative. Uh, Yes. And I want to stimulate the creativity of people, no matter what their condition. When you think we we were pioneers crossing this nation in covered wagons with no help at all, that people have done the most magnificent things. We climb every mountain, we cross every river. So by identifying the solutions and what works and connecting them through local media and Internet, and having a global celebration all around the world for every culture, every nation, every religion of people who are creative, I think we can help lift the system and support the political efforts to change the system from inside itself. Yes, indeed. One of my favorite books was written by Gordon Davidson and Corinne McLaughlin called Spiritual Politics, Changing the World from the Inside Out. And it was all about changing ourselves sufficiently to shift the body politic. The two didn't happen separate from each other. Rocky, I have to say I see your candidacy as president, the courage it it takes, as Barbara just indicated, the commitment it takes. After all, you're doing this because your heart was broken. I know I've spoken with you. You saw what was happening to our country, and you wanted to reconnect to its original vision of, of greatness and of generosity and kindness and virtue in itself and for the world. What would you do upon becoming president or becoming very influential in the body politic to bring that about? Well, Mitchell, I think that it does take all of us understanding and being inspired to act, that that we can all be engaged. It's not enough just for us to be isolated and to to work on ourselves and and complain. Then then each of us, as we get to be better, we're going to be a better community. That's not the end of it. It requires engagement. It requires every one of us. You know, there are three basic types of people in the world. There are those who do harm, the perpetrators. And then there's the vast majority of people, and those are the bystanders that accommodate 
the, the wrongdoing by standing back and finding all sorts of excuses not to act. And I'm hearing it from a lot of people, and very sadly, a lot of young people right now who, who feel that things are hopeless, that they, they can't really make a difference, how are we going to combat all this money, all these excuses to be resigned and not take on the responsibility to act and engage. And then the third category are the upstanders, the people who see wrongdoing, and they say, forget the excuses. We're going to go take it on, and, and, you know, no matter what happens, we're going to be able to look back in our lives and say, we stood up against it. We fought for what was right. Yes. And that's that really is the American way. Look at the founders. Look at the people who have fought and given the ultimate price in Indeed. so many cases, millions of lives yes. given for our freedoms and for the freedoms of other people around the world. And we're sitting back right now in, in what's becoming Gulag America, where the president and Congress claim the power of government to round folks up and indefinitely detain them or to put U.S. citizens on assassination lists. And what we're seeing is this sort of team mentality where because it's a Democratic president, all these people say, well, I know I'm in the Democratic Party, so I'm really not going to raise a ruckus. Yet, if that person had an R after his name, and it was George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney in the Oval Office looking at these these baseball card-like biographies and photos of these folks and deciding who's going to live and who's going to die, and in the meantime, killing off off hundreds of innocent civilians, including hundreds of children, Yes, the, people would be in the streets. Exactly. We would see an opposition party. <laughs> and that's why I say, each of us, we need to reach deeply into our humanity and say, mm. we're going to draw a line. We will not stand for this anymore. And in doing that, we become better people. Rocky yes, Anderson, I want to thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Yes, Barbara, please weigh in. We only have one I, more minute left. Okay, I just want to say that please. I believe, yes, from the inside out, but we're talking about innovation solutions connecting. And in order to support what you're saying, Rocky, the more we can act on what's working, and I'm talking right. about innovations in health, in education, in energy systems. And I'm an advocate of what Buckminster Fuller said, is we now have the resources, technology, and know-how to make a world work if we're connected with each other in our creativity. So Absolutely. Our, whole, our 2012, Birth 2012 movement is a call for everybody on Earth to do that to support the political initiatives that are required to make the system itself transform. And I, I just want to thank you very much for this huge effort you're making. Thank you, Barbara. And, and, and I love the, the outlook that you bring to this because we can all evolve. We can choose the way that we evolve both personally and as a community. And in doing that, we create a more peaceful and better world if we all stand together and fight for what's right. Wonderful. Well, you, you are my candidate, Rocky. There we go. <laughs> We're going to get all the ev evolutionaries behind you now. That's all wonderful. Right. Let, let's go do it. Okay. Barbara, thank Mark so Hubbard, much. thank you so much. Thank Rocky, you. indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Mitchell. Absolutely, so Rocky. Much. Thanks for being on, and we'll be continuing on.